Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so yes, my name is Julian. I work for Facebook. And today, I want to talk about Hack. So Hack is a programming language that we open sourced about one year ago. And um, well, there has been, there's one thing that very few people know about Hack is how extensively we use it at Facebook. Um, Hack is de facto the server-side language at Facebook. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. What that means is that when you hit Facebook.com, or you pull out your phone, and you get a notification, or basically any interaction that you have with Facebook servers, these servers are running Hack code. All right. Now, you can imagine that with that so many lines of code and so many developers, thousands of developers, well, we've worked very hard to make that the development environment and the programming language hack better and better. And that's what I want to talk about today. So what I'd like to do with you guys today is basically give you a snippet of how it feels to program in hack and why I think it's a, it's a really cool programming environment. All right, before I start, um, so I'm going to oversimplify. So please don't hold it against me. But I'm going to say there are roughly two categories of programming languages. You have statically typed programming languages. So that's Java, C Sharp, C++. You've got dynamically typed programming language. And these are JavaScript, Python, Perl. So what's the big difference between the two? With the statically typed languages, what you do is that you first write your code. Then something checks that this code is correct regarding the typing. And then you run the code. When you're using a dynamic language, what happens is you run the code directly, and you'll figure out at runtime if something went wrong. And Hack is kind of in between the two. It's a gradually typed language. What that means is that it's your decision. You get to decide if you want to use it as a dynamically typed language or as a statically typed language. You get to draw this line. And you can do it at a very fine grain. You can do it for each function if you want to. So that's what gradually type means. You can see the link there, hacklang.org. And on this link, there is documentation and there's a tutorial that you can use online. So um, you don't have to install anything, and you can play with a type checker online without installing anything, which is pretty convenient if you want to get to know the, the language. So before I get into the specifics of the language, I'd like to say a couple of words about HHVM. So HHVM and Hack are two things you'll hear about often together. HHVM is to hack what the JVM is to Java. So it's a thing that runs Hack, right? And um, you're probably familiar with that technology, because most of you know JavaScript. It's a JIT compiler. What that means is that it runs, it translates to nat native code on the fly. The reason why it's important is because Hack can be used as a dynamic language if you want to efficiently, thanks to that technology. The other thing that's interesting about it is that HHVM now powers a tremendous amount of requests. So there's Facebook, of course, but now there's Wikipedia, there's Beidou, there's Box. That's a huge amount of traffic. And Box is even considering switching to Hack. The reason why it's so exciting is that with so much traffic, there's a lot of vested interest in making that platform better and faster. And when I say, so we're going to make it be better. And when I say we, I don't just mean Facebook, as much as the open source community around these projects, which is pretty exciting. All right, so oftentimes people ask me, what's cool about Hack and what's fun about it? And unfortunately, it's not so much about the language. It's really about this. So this is basically the iteration cycle between you when you're writing a line of code and the moment where you see the change in the browser or the mobile app or whatever it is you're programming. The point of Hack is to preserve that cycle. I said earlier that statically typed language first check your program and then run it. The problem is it takes time to run those checks. If, ever, if, if some of you guys have used a linter before, well, you know that when you run the linter, you actually have to wait for that linter to finish. And that's very inefficient, because what we want is preserve the velocity for developers. We want them to be able to edit their code, press refresh, see the results straight away. So how do we reconcile the two? 
How do we get instantaneous checks in that loop? So the way the checker works is very unconventional. It's not a binary that you run from your command line. The hack type checker is actually a daemon. It's a daemon that runs in the background and watches the file system. So when you start it, it takes all of your files in. And then whatever you do, whatever you change on the file system, the background server is going to update the state of the world incrementally. So the reason why it's so cool is that not only do you get your checks instantly, and when I say instantly, we're talking in tens of milliseconds here. So you will not notice. Not only do you get that, but you get a bunch of really cool tooling around it, such as autocomplete, search, find references, whatever you want, instantly. Because this thing knows about the entire code base at any given time, all the time. Another thing that's super cool about Hack, and I want to share with you guys, so that's actually an, an example that you can find online, so you can play with it if you want to, is how cool the error messages are. I know error messages are typically not something super sexy, but in Hack, I really think that they're special because they come in multiple parts. They really try to tell you a story. In red, so here it's a function add one that takes an integer, and we pass the string to that, to that uh, function. And the hack error message comes in three parts. In red, you see where the error is. That's the problem. That's where you made a mistake. But in yellow, it tells you which part of your code you have to edit to fix the problem. And that's huge. If you guys are used to coding, you have a bunch of unit tests, you run those unit tests, then you debug them to see what went wrong, that's going to take you a really long time to figure out what part of the code you have to edit. In this case, what the, hack, what the error message is telling you, hey, this is an error on my string. Now you either have to modify hello or the int over there, but both together are not going to, to work together. So with shortcuts, it can bring you directly to the place that you have to modify. And this is huge in terms of velocity. Now, I've talked some about the environment, like how it feels to run, hack, have error messages, yada, yada, yada. I'd like to talk some more about the language itself. And some of the constructions are going to, to feel familiar. So <clears throat> I said HHVM makes your code run fast, which is great. But as some of you may know, you, there's actually a bunch of time that we're spending not waiting on the CPU. There's a bunch of time where you need to fetch some data from a database, or you need to fetch some data from somewhere else, or whatever it is you're doing. When that happens, you're stuck on I.O. You're waiting for I.O. to come back. And you may have tried to uh, use callbacks or other kind of promises or other kind of systems to solve that problem. But basically, the problem is that you would like to do something else while you're waiting. And what async await does is that it allows you to express in a very natural way the fact that you can interrupt a function. So here, the keyword async in front of the function basically means that this function can be interrupted. And the keyword await in front of the call to curl exec basically means that, hey, curl exec is an asynchronous function, and I want to wait for the result of that function that comes back asynchronously. OK, so that's pretty cool. But in this case, we're only fetching one thing, which is not very interesting. right? The whole point is when you're doing multiple things at the same time. And you'll have the runtime that is going to reorganize those fetches. So in this case, I'm fetching three things. Three things, sorry. Um, two um, websites, two uh, URLs, and one call to another asynchronous function. So what's in interesting about this is that the runtime is going to reorder the calls depending on which one comes back first. What's even more interesting is that it, that it looks very similar to normal code, to the code you would have written synchronously. So I'm not going to spend too much time on async await because that's a feature that exists in other languages, but it, it's pretty cool. One thing that's pretty unique about Hack is nullable and how nullable work. So Null is evil. The reason why it's evil is that most of the time, things are not null. So you're using your object, and you are programming your code thinking in the back of your mind, this thing is not null, because that's the normal use case. right? And at Facebook, we got um, slowed down by this dramatically. There were many, many cases where programmers just assumed that things were not null, 
And then most of the time they went, and then in some weird edge case in production, boom, things break, things blow up. And so what we wanted was a way to avoid that problem. And we introduced the nullable type. So the question mark in front of the user here is basically the way to say in hack that something can be null. And what's really cool about this is that it's the type checker that will tell you the, that something can be null statically before you run your code. That's even better when you're making a change. Let's say you have a piece of code that works beautifully and you decide to make that thing null in some cases. Well, now you have the type checker that tells you all the places in your code base that you have to fix, and that's awesome. Another interesting thing is that the way you deal with null is not going to be very different from the way you deal with it in JavaScript or any other dynamic language. You see this piece of code that says, if dollar user equal null, then throw an exception? The type checker can pick that up. It can pick that up in the sense that it knows that past this if statement, we know that user is not null, because otherwise we would have thrown. So what I'm trying to, to get to here is that the code that you will write will look very similar to the code that you're already writing. So it's not going to change dramatically the way you write things. The last thing I'd like to talk about is XHP. So for those of you who are familiar with React, it's a very similar system where we want to be able to basically compose semi-structured data. We want to compose trees. One obvious application when you're writing server-side logic is HTML. So what's really cool about writing HTML that way is that you know that you'll get the escaping right, and you know that you won't forget about anything. But on top of that, with XHP, it's composable in the sense that you can create your own components. So here I've used uh, only predefined um, HTML components, but I could have created my own. So this is an example of creating the component FB feed story, which has a render function, and the render function will describe how this component is rendered and itself uses um, uh, FB title, which is a class that defines another component, and so on and so forth. So what's really cool about this is that it composes well, and you can use them as objects. So as you see here, you have a class, which means that this class can have other methods. You can extend it. You can use it as a very normal object. Um, now, if I put all this together, this is what it looks like, and which was really what my intention was. What I wanted was to end this, this uh, talk with a snippet of code that really looks like the kind of code that you would write if you were writing hack. And so, of course, it's simplified, but frankly, it's not that far off. Like, await is a feature that we use all over the place at Facebook. So if you were joining Facebook tomorrow, that's really the kind of code you would be writing. And you have a bit everything here. You deal with a null. You have a, an asynchronous call, and you, 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 uh, uh, you produced an XHP component after this, synchronous, this asynchronous call succeeded. Um, so I've talked about three types here. There was um, async await, there was nullable, there was XHP. So these are three very important features. But there's a ton of features. So of course, I can't, you know, uh, show them all to you today, but you can play with them, uh, play with them online, or install um, the, the package online. And what I'm trying to say is that some of it is actually pretty advanced, stuff that you would find in pretty advanced programming languages such as co and contravariance support. It's, it's actually pretty rich, and there's a lot you can do with it. And again, here's the link, hacklang.org, if you want to try this out without installing anything. And that's kind of it for me. Um, I just wanted to put out there that I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited to hear about your thoughts. Um, one thing that excites me about this project is that we're really just at the beginning, right? I feel like this is just starting. Like, we have feedback from the open source community, from users outside of Facebook, and this is really an exciting time because it's still early, and you can contribute to help us shape the, the future of the language. Which is, which is awesome. Thank you.